Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Happy New Year. Why don't you all stand with us while we start to worship, please. today. Uh, January 7th, 8 a.m., men's breakfast. Also on January 7th at 10 a.m. Um, is going to be our kindness outreach. Um, that's going to be at Walmart. You just meet at Walmart at 10 a.m., handing out chocolate to the community. Prayer night uh, is going to be January 8th, 530 to 630. Um, we need everybody there. Something's flying over my head. Sorry. Um, everybody there, everybody that can come, um, make it to that one. We can pray for this year coming up. Um, definitely need that. Uh, Trail Life and American Heritage Girls. Uh, troops meet on Sundays at 530. Um, it says there's still plenty of time to sign up. So if you're not, if your child is not involved in that yet, and um, 
I personally can't remember the age group for that. But if your child's not signed up for that, I think it goes through kindergarten through 12th grade. Thank you. Okay. Heritage Girls is the same? All right. So kindergarten through 12th grade, if you're not, your child's not in that, they can still sign up for that. Um, and then new beginnings need for, oh, it says need for December. I assume we're still <laughs> doing that. Besides seven and eight boys and girls shoes, 12 months and up, PJs, boy and girl, and the kids clothes hangers. So if you can donate any of those things, um, you put it in the wooden chest that's outside the church office. Um, and then the welcome crew, anybody that's on the welcome crew, uh, meet Lane after church. You want them out there up here, up here, up front for your shirt. Welcome crew up here for your shirt after church. And then in one of the Sunday school rooms, they found this phone. <laughs> so they asked me to announce that if you have lost your phone, is it yours? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I got it up here for you. It's found. Oh, okay. Jonathan has it. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Let's pray, and then we'll meet and greet each other. Father God, we thank you for this day. Um, we thank you for new beginnings, Lord, for the, a new year, um, a time when we can reflect on uh, what maybe we didn't accomplish last year that, that uh, uh, we wanted to accomplish and start that fresh and anew, um, uh, especially a relationship with you to renew our efforts at that, God. And we just thank you for um, a chance to begin anew. Um, be with us today during um, the rest of worship and during the message, Lord, um, that your word is heard. What you want your, our family here to learn today um, comes shining through as we all step out of the way and allow that to happen. Uh, we thank you and we praise you uh, in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, Y'all have, a, I was going to say, have a seat. Stand up, <laughs> meet and greet each other. <laughs> Wandering into the night Wanting a place to hide This weary soul This bag of bones And I try with all my might And I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting Oh vagabond Just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. He picked me up, he turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because he healed my heart, he changed my name. the master I thank the Savior I thank God My church. I cannot deny what I see I've got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning like I 
ashes in the wind So, so long to my old friends Burden and bitterness You can just keep them moving Now, you ain't welcome here
doing this, um, and y'all know every time I get up here and talk about communion, I cry, so um, we're just going to have a prayer real quick. Um, if you have your communion cup and your um, wafer, feel free to take that once the prayer is over. Father God, um, we just thank you again for this day. We thank you for um, all the many, many blessings, Lord, that you've put in our paths. Um, it's nothing we deserve nothing we can work for, nothing we can earn, um, but just simply your mercy and your grace, God, and we just thank you for that. We thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for this building and this people and uh, everybody in this room and all of our um, family that's uh, still watching online, and um, we just ask your blessings on this communion, on this time that we're taking to remember your sacrifice and your grace that is just poured out on us, God, and we thank you for that. In Christ's name, amen. Pray with me for the offering. Father God, once again, we thank you for um, all those blessings that you provide for us and um, in just such a small way we can give back to you, Lord. Um, we just pray this uh, this offering, this tithe and offering to you, um, that you take what is received and multiply it exponentially, Lord, this would be a way only you can. In Christ's name I pray.
How are we? Wow. There's a lot of you here today. It's good to see you, kind of. Let me pray for us before we get going. Um, today, man, this, this sermon has been on my heart for a while, um, but let me pray for us and we'll get going. God, thank you for just another year that we get to see. Um, God, and as we look at your creation, and we understand who you are as a creator, open our minds and open our hearts to your character and who you are. Thank you, Lord, for another year where we can just celebrate our relationship with you. And Lord, if we don't have a relationship with you, God, thank you for the opportunity that we have today to hear your word and make a decision to follow you. In your name we pray. Amen. So the lights are down on purpose. 
okay? So just bear with me. In Genesis 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse that separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let there be waters under the heaven. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit bearing trees, fruit in which their seed, each according to which kind on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seeds according to their own kind and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanses of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be signs for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth to rule the day and to rule the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with living creatures and let the birds fly above and across the earth in the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters and seas, and let the birds multiply upon the earth. And there was evening and morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, And the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their own kinds, and the livestock according to their own kinds, and everything that creeps creeps on the ground according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over our livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps along the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves along the earth. And God said, behold, I have given to you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit you shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and everything that creeps on the earth everything that has breath of life I have given every green plant for food and it was so and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. 
So as we look at creation and everything that comes with it, my prayer this morning is that we will look into this and we will dive into this. And we will see exactly how big our God is. We will see exactly how magnificent our creator is. So what do you say? Let's dive in. To understand, you can go ahead and turn those lights. Thank you. <laughs> to understand our basic Christian theology, we have to understand basic Christian things, right? What is creation? Well, we read how the earth was created in six days just now, or we heard. You have to understand that this is one of the biggest oppositions that creationists, such as you and I, believe is when an evolutionary theory comes into play and someone says something along the lines of, well, billions of years, eons, all of these things, right? And sometimes if you ever get the opportunity to get in a conversation with somebody like that, it's a really interesting conversation. How do we talk to people about what we believe if we don't understand what we believe? So... I'm going to try to help us out on a couple of things. So as we move forward, we're going to try to understand not only what the creation belief is, the creationist belief, but also the evolutionary theory and what that looks like. If you hear of someone that talks about evolutionary theory, you need to ask them which theory because there's six. Okay, I'm going to go over them with you. Number one, you have cosmic evolution. This is typically the Big Bang, the origin of time, space, and matter. Whenever you hear someone talk about creation being the Big Bang, they are speaking of cosmic evolution. Number two, you have chemical evolution. This is something, the origin of something higher element than hydrogen, okay? So chemical evolution. Stellar or planetary evolution. You've got the origin of the stars and planets. Organic evolution. The origin of life. I'm going to wait because some of you guys are writing a little bit. You have microevolution. This is the changing from one kind of an animal to another kind of animal. Okay? You also see this. This, is, this one, along with your cosmic evolution, are where a lot of the conversations with evolutionary theorists, that this is where they come from, right? Monkey to man, tadpole to person, you know, that's, that's where this comes from. Macroevolution is number six. These are variations within kinds, okay? So I'm going to give you an example of macroevolution. If I have a German Shepherd, which I do, and I have an Old English Bulldog, which I do, and they have a puppy, which they haven't, <laughs> it's going to be a goofy-looking dog, right? But guess what? It's still a dog. If I have a child... It's still a human being. Do we understand? This is the only evolutionary theory that has ever been observed. And I just gave you two examples. Okay? So when you're looking at evolutionary theory versus creationism, we need to understand the concept behind what they are talking about. Okay? What they like to do, what people like to do, is they like to start twisting words up. And they try to start talking about the Big Bang and all the other things. So... The first question we're going to discuss here is how was the world created? We read how it was created. However, if you talk to an evolutionary theorist, theist, they are going to claim that the earth was at one time all matter, everything that has matter, right? Matter was all combined in, in this little bitty space about the size. Come here, you. You, yep. White shirt, black stripes. You see that period? Yeah. That's where all of matter consisted of. The period on a page is about where all of the matter within our universe was at. You guys understand that? Look at the period on your page if you see it. That is apparently where all of matter was. Now, to go into the Big Bang, what happened, according to that, was this area started to spin. And it got faster, and it got faster, and it got faster. And as it got faster, it created friction, which created heat, which caused an explosion. If you know anything about centrifugal force, if I were to put all of our youth here on one of those spinny things in a park, okay, 
You know what I'm talking about? Where kids get chucked off of them like every time they go. If I were to put all of our youth on there and I were to hook my truck up to it with a rope and I were to start spinning that thing, right? Eventually, they're going to go flying off. I'm not going to do that unless you guys are down. But (laughs) eventually, they're going to go flying off. Now, the cool thing about centrifugal force is if I have an element and I start spinning it really fast and it explodes, all of those fragments from that piece are going to spin in the exact same direction as the nucleus that was originally spinning, right? So let's entertain the idea for a moment that evolution is true, right? That would mean that every planet within our solar system would have to spin in the exact same direction as the original spinning fragment, which they don't. Venus and Uranus, Uranus, whatever you want to call it, spin in opposite directions. So automatically, you could say that that was disproved. However, because we're talking about God and how big he is and cool he is, we're going to keep talking about how big he is and how cool he is. The Bible tells us, and that's what we base everything off of, that in the very first sentence of the, the Bible that we claim that we say runs our life, the very first sentence in the very first chapter says, in the beginning, that tells you the time it started, God created. It doesn't say matter was in the space of a period. It doesn't say that things just became. It doesn't say tadpole to, you know, human. It says in the beginning, God created. Okay? That is what the book that we claim says. To understand creation begins with the knowledge knowledge that the creation was created by what? A creator. Right? Right? Have you guys ever heard the story of the watch? I'm sure somebody's heard it. If I were to take pieces of a watch, right? If I were to take all the pieces of a watch, take it all apart, put it in a bag, and shake it for 30 billion years. 30 billion years. What is the likelihood that in 30 billion years, I will pull out a watch that is not only working, but it's on time, there are no blemishes. What, what's the probability of that? Zero. Is that me? Nope. There's zero probability of that. So when we're talking to someone that doesn't necessarily believe that we do, a lot of times I've noticed that sometimes we start to get really defensive. Right? Well, because the Bible says, yes, it does, but you have to, we have to be able to explain what the Bible is to people that don't understand the Bible, right? We have to be able to explain the Bible to people that don't believe in God. The number one rule here is that we're looking at salvation first. We're looking at someone to be reconciled with God before we can have these deep diving conversations exactly the way that we kind of look at how they should go, right? Because if they don't understand God, then your theory and your basis is they're not going to hear it, right? Uh, My favorite conversation, I was watching a video of, of a guy that was having a conversation and they said, well, explain to me, um, you know, evolutionary theory without using the Bible. He said, well, that I can't. That's not fair. Well, then explain to me evolutionary theory without science. If we're going to do this, right, we have to understand that everything that we believe is based out of this, right? It's not based out of a college. It's not based out of, you know, all, all things college. It's, it's not based out of what we were taught when we were kids. It's based out of this. What blows my mind here, church, is that we have all these answers in this book. And you can go get one of these. Heck, I'll give you one. I will give you one for free that has all your answers. But we never pick it up. We never actually look into the details of creation and understanding where we came from, where the birds of the sky came from, where the fish of the sea came from, how it all came to be. We look at this because it's something that we put on our table when our church friends come over so that they think we're reading it. But we're not sometimes. I'm not saying everybody, but sometimes that's the case. Moving on. Now, let's let's, let's think about the order of events, right? So we learned that God created vegetation, right? 
And then God created animals. Now, do I believe that God created the world in six literal days? Absolutely. Why? Because it says there was morning and evening the first day. Scripture. Evening and morning. Could God have created it in 10,000 years? He could have. Could he have created it at the snap of a finger? Yeah, he could have. Matter of fact, when Jesus or when God, both of them, because they were both there, right, said, let there be light, and light flew out of his mouth, and bam, there's light. It's amazing to look at the creator God literally putting things into existence with his word. And so when we're talking about this, and we're looking at this, are we seeing how big our God is? When we look at the biology and the makeup of human being, I love this quote. And it's by Charles Darwin himself. In his book, and this is a long one, it sounds like a chapter, but this is the title, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. <gasps> This is his quote, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Did you know that in your eye, your retina has 137 million light sensitive receptors in one eyeball, 137 million. Where's my electricians at? Where'd John go? He quit. Where's my electricians at? Where's my sparkies at? Nobody? Oh, Harvey's fishing, I think. All right, well, if John was here, I would ask him this question. Can you imagine taking 137 little receptors and hooking them all up to one area and making sure every single thing worked? That's what our God did. Even Charles Darwin himself said, my theory is flawed because it doesn't make sense. It makes no sense. Right? It, it, anyway. All right, number two. The problem that we see here and across the board for all the arguments between creationists and evolutionists is between two things, faith and science. Okay? Between these two people, this is where we see the biggest dilemma. We have seen throughout history, man's always tried to be greater than God. Even in Hebrews, we see in context of the law of Moses where Jesus was walking upon the earth and these men that were called Judaizers who claimed that Jesus was there to destroy the law of Moses, right? Just for context purposes. Hebrews 3, verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. The comparison made here is that Moses was created by God, but God is to receive the glory for all of the things that Moses has done. Verse 3, we're going back one verse. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. As much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. See, here's the thing. I wanted to bring a hammer, but then I didn't. Um, I wanted to bring a hammer and show you, and Dan used this last week with, with the glove. This hammer, if I, if I set this hammer right here and I say, build a house, it won't. It won't. It is a tool that I can use to build a house. But it's not going to build a house on its own. You understand that Moses was not just a man who came and did all these great things because he was Moses. Moses came and did all these great things because he was following God and God was in him. Just like the glove. We are tools that God uses for his glory. We have the opportunity to know our creator God beyond anything that we could ever imagine. And we can read this book and we can understand that, yes, the Trinity is a very real thing. We serve a very real triune God. And we can find the verses within this book that prove it. Because those are conversations that are hard to have, too, with people. Explain to me the Trinity. My next sermon's on that. Promise. We will never be the builder ourselves. 
Evolution will never be the builder. God is the only builder. He alone is the one who took dust and breathed life into the nostrils. In his own image. He alone. When you hear someone speak of the universe, because even in context to evolutionists and evolutionary theory, you hear people talk about the universe a lot, right? Well, the universe is eons and billions and trillions and quadrillions and numbers that we've never even heard of before made up, right? Ask them, what does the word universe mean? What, what's the definition of the word universe? Because I'm going to give it to you. It's right here. Boop. Boop. Uni is single and verse is spoken sentence. Do we see where we're going here? For two Latin words put together, uni, single, verse, spoken sentence. If I were to ask you, over everything we've talked about today, with creation, with God saying, let there be light, and let there be this, and let there be that. Where's the single spoken sentence that we see? Go ahead. So we're not talking about some little God who just kind of, you know, does things, right? Everything with God is intentional. Have you ever noticed that? Everything with God is intentional. Every single detail. In Colossians 1, verses 16 through 17, for by him all things were created that are, on, that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things that were created through him were, were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him are all things consistent. So I read the New King James Version, so you might have a different version up there. Okay, so just be prepared for that. But to assume that a scientist, for example, can, can go into a room and create something, if I were to take the world's top scientist, I'm talking top tier, not Fauci, bigger than that. Biggest scientist, right? If I take the biggest scientist, look, I'm not, no, I'm not getting that I'm just, he's a scientist that I know of, okay? But if I were to take a scientist into a room and put them there, shut the doors, and there's nothing there. I'm talking, we clean this place, right? We hired the best cleaners in the world to come in there and clean this room, right? No dust, no nothing. And they go in there, and then you come over the intercom and say, go ahead and make something, and they can't. They can't. You can't put the world's top scientists in a room and expect them to create something because they are not a creator. They're a catalyst. They can take one thing and help it become something else and make it better or worse but they can't create it they can't if you give them absolutely nothing and tell them to create something it's impossible but when you're talking about a star breathing god and someone who takes dust and forms it into something in his own image and goes and breathes life into it yeah he can do whatever he wants he can literally take nothing and make something. He is a creator of not just time, but also space and also matter. He's a creator of all this. That's the God we're talking about, folks. That is the God that we serve. Everything has a design. And everything was made by a loving God whose intention was perfection. However, we messed it up. We need to understand that because of sin, not because God doesn't love us. I, I just don't understand how you could worship a God who lets all this terrible stuff happen. <laughs> we earned everything that we get, folks. Okay, Because of sin, decay and rot has entered our life. Because of sin, decay and rot has entered. We have to understand that we do serve a loving God. But we have to understand that there are consequences for sin. Whatever that looks like. 
You got to understand also that in Genesis alone, the very first chapter, we read that the origin of mankind, as well as the stars in the sky and the animals in the earth, were designed and created. And here's the thing. When you go home and you look in the mirror, and you look at who you are in the mirror, and you see your face, and your wrinkles, and your scratches, and your dark hair, blonde hair, gray hair, no hair. And you look yourself in the eyes, and you look at yourself, and I want you to think this thought. Not only was I created, but I was number one, created in the image of God, but number two, he loves me enough to let me look at myself and understand how good of a God he is. In Romans 1, 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because he's shown it to them. For his invisible attribute, attributes, namely his entire eternal power, I can't read today, and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Look around you. You want to see God? You haven't seen God show up in your life for a long time? Look around you. He's proven himself time and time and time and time and time again with the rain falling from the sky, with the seasons that come, with the heat of the day and the cool of the night. He's proven himself time and time again. You don't believe in God. I hate it for you because he believes that you're there and one day you're going to get to meet him face to face. Here's the scariest part to me. Number four says we are without excuse. See, in this verse here, what's happening is they're making these idols and they're worshiping these idols and they're claiming that God is not as big as he says he is. But this verse tells us very clearly he's proven himself so much that we have zero excuse in our unbelief. We come up with all these things that we like to just throw out as our excuses on why we don't have a relationship with this God that we call God. We claim and we say and we discount and we just kind of, nah, whatever, I'm so busy and whatever dumb thing we come up with. We are without excuse. And here's the fear, folks. One day, I preached, a, I preached a funeral this past Monday. I didn't know the gentleman. <clears throat> I got to know the family a little bit better. But what worries me is this, and it's, it's any funeral. It's just any funeral. It makes you think this. Did they have enough time to meet Jesus and really have a relationship with him? Even if they were saved, did they have enough time to really grow in him? Did they have enough time to really develop this relationship with them? Did they have time to really understand who God was and who they were in God and all these things? What was, what, what's our excuse, church? Am I telling you that you need to be in church every Sunday? Yeah, it'd be great, but you can't, and I understand that. Am I telling you that you need to you know, give all your money to the poor and to the church and to the people. and, to, and That'd be great, but you can't. Am I telling you that you should be in your Bible every single day and you should be building a relationship with the star-breathing, living-breathing God? Absolutely no excuse. None. Your job has nothing to do with this. Your finances have nothing to do with this. Your lifestyle and, and the time that you do whatever you do in, whatever it looks like, has nothing to do with you sitting down and intentionally picking this up, opening it, and studying the God that created you to be who you are in His image. None. We are without excuse, church. 
We don't have a good enough excuse that one day when we die and we stare our Jesus in the face, hopefully we understand that it's probably not going to happen because he's going to be so much glory, we're going to be on our face. But when we have the opportunity to encounter our Savior physically, spiritually, and we're there with him, we're going to try, some of us, to come up with all the excuses of why we did it. And there is none that are acceptable. Not one. This is another thing that's concerning. I hate to hear Christians that claim Jesus say, I believe in the God of the Bible, but I struggle with how the world came to be and all these things because science makes more sense. Listen, I'm with you. Science is cool. You know what I mean? I love science. I love science. But when you deep dive off into something that is the, a science that is intentionally trying to disprove God, here's the thing. God created science. Remember that verse when I said, in him and through him, all things were created? That's, science is in there. Love science. But what are we using? Because the enemy loves to do this. He loves to take a good thing and go and twist it around and make it into something that's trying to disprove our God. Trying to pull you away from our God. Whatever that looks like. Not just science, but other things. He tries so hard, and sometimes we just let him. We just let him do it. I'm going to ask a personal question. Okay? Whether you're a Second Amendment believer or not, or whatever, it doesn't matter. If someone was coming to take your children away, how hard would you fight for your kids? Hard, right? Probably to the death. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. If someone was coming for your spouse, hopefully, ladies and gentlemen, you would fight to the death for your spouse. If someone was coming for your job, you might fight a little bit. Some of us might be like, you can have it. I've been trying to get rid of this for 20 years, <laughs> right? I was giving it away with a car and everything. But what if somebody's coming after your God? Most important relationship in your life, or it should be. What if somebody's coming for it? Because I've said this, you hear it a million more times too. The devil doesn't care about you. <laughs> he doesn't care about you. All he cares about is checking off another block. And you're a block. But as that song said today, can you make that claim? Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Can you make that statement? You are not just, insert your name here. You are not just a mom or a dad or a grandmother or a grandfather or a child or daughter or son. Doesn't matter. You're not just that. You are an image bearer of the almighty God who was given life because he has a plan for you. That's the intention here. Not just did he create what you, you go outside. Look at everything. Everything. Look at it. He made it. Right? Everything natural. Okay? Look at that. You want to look at the building? Cool. He had a part in that too. We just talked about the hammer, right? Everything he created. He created the birds. And I love thinking about, and I, I just love this. If you get to go out and, and just sit in nature and just enjoy, even if you don't hunt, just go somewhere and sit down and just listen, right? If you're near a horse farm, go up to the fence and just hang out and watch them. If you're, if you're near a cattle farm, Plug your nose and go hang out and watch them, right? <laughs> but out of all these things that were created, it's hard to believe that you're loved more than that, right? When I look at that and I go, there's no way. 
That's such a majestic creature. But you're loved more than that because that cow, thank goodness, and this horse, thank goodness, and that puffer fish that's all goofy looking was not made in the image of God. You were. You were bought with a price and you were made in the image of an almighty God. Church, understand the severity behind what you believe. And, And this is basic. Creation is basic. It's detailed, but it's basic. Genesis 126 again. Then God said, let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. Now here's the thing. Going into the Trinity a little bit here, just kind of as a teaser. Let us underline that word. Make man in our, underline that word, own image. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth. Every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Not only were you created in God's image, but you were given a role. You're part of God's kingship. As created beings, the intention for you and I is not to be so charismatic in a belief that is intending to disprove God when there's not enough evidence to even start with to disprove Him. But rather, it's for us to give ourselves up daily in order that we can somehow bring Him glory. Somehow. I want to encourage you. Don't be afraid of science. Don't be afraid of it. But don't let it turn you from God. If you want to look at science, if, if, you're, if you're a doctor a lawyer, or, or veterinarian, I know we got veterinarians and doctors and everything else, and science is a huge part of, of that skill set. Rather than looking at it in such a way that maybe, it, and the intention isn't to disprove our God, but sometimes there's little trip holds in there, Maybe let's use science students or whatever to actually find ways to prove God. You know, there's all kinds of ways in science that prove God. Perfect example was the Darwin quote. This man spent his entire life trying to disprove God and evolution. And then he figured it out. I can't. Because it doesn't make sense. I want you guys to go home, and, and I'll, I'll, Dan, maybe we can send a, a text message out or something. Louis Giglio, who's a pastor, he's an amazing, amazing pastor. He has a video called How Great Is Our God, and he talks about all these stars in comparison to the earth. And I want you to go home, and I want you to watch this video. It's 45 minutes long, okay? If you can watch football for 45 minutes to seven hours, you can watch a 45-minute video about Jesus, okay? Just want to encourage you on that. But I want you to really pay attention to, and he names them, and he shows them on this big screen behind him, and he shows this little golf ball, and he's like, this is the earth, pretend this is the earth, then that star that's on that screen is the size of that compared to the earth. That's how big our God is. You you think we're talking about some God that's working on some little small scale here that just kind of makes all these little insects and stuff. No, we're talking about a God who's, who's created stars and planets and galaxies that we've not even discovered. We're talking about a God who has created everything within our oceans, that we know more about our space than we do our oceans. We're talking about that kind of God. We're not talking about some little bitty God that just can't work out your problems because he's too busy. Church, please. Today is the very first day of 2023. From 2020 to 2022, Life has been really tough on a lot of people, on pretty much everybody. Wouldn't it be great if we as a body believed and decided that in 2023, every single detail about my life, to include my time, my money, the way I raise my kids, the way I talk to my spouse and treat my spouse, the way that I look at going to church or not going to church, the way that I look at other people who are less fortunate than me, if every single detail within our life was intentionally based around God being involved. The very first day, folks. Imagine if we all in this room decided that's what we're going to do. Because here's the deal. Our mission as a believer is not to fill these seats up. 
It is not to fill these seats up. Our mission as believers is not to bring a bunch of people to cool events that we have. Nope. Our mission should be to bring, to bring people to a Savior that loves them more than anything else on the face of this planet. Everything else on the face of this planet. He loves them so much, he's, he died, was resurrected, went to heaven and says, I'll be back because I'm preparing a place for you. He's building you a daggum house. The Savior that we... My wife, golly. Men... Y'all better find, gentlemen, where are they at? You and where are the other young people at? Y'all better look for you a woman that grabs you by the hair sometimes and shut your face and listen to me, right? She didn't do that. It's not an abusive thing, okay? It's just figurative. She said something to me the other day because I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I struggle with, with what I see when I look at the image that I see. I struggle with the things that, that I've gone through and I've dealt with and, and the, the, the trouble and the stuff. And I ask this question to myself all the time. I love this because I get to understand that because of who I am in Christ doesn't make me who I am in my eyes. It makes me who I am in his eyes. My wife told me, you are humanizing God too much. You are saying that our big God that you claim created all this can't fix your problems? Shut up! Stop with your dumb excuses. Stop it. And she walked off. I had to sit there and wall her in that for a little bit. <laughs> Love my wife, man. Guys, we do that. We humanize this giant God who created everything and say he can't fix this. He can't forgive me for that. He can't let me get past this. I've got so much heartache. I've got so much problem. I've got so much trouble. I've done so much wrong. He can't. But because he's a loving God, he does. Fix your mind, people. Fix your mind. My <laughs> drill sergeant used to say, get your mind right or push it out. You can sit there and do push-ups till your mind got right. It took like five for me, Right? <laughs> But we had to do it with everybody else whose mind wasn't right, too. Maybe we should do that. All right, everybody. Somebody send. Everybody push. No. Just kidding. As the band comes, understand when you read this word and you study things like creation, understand what kind of God you're talking about. I want you to understand the magnitude and the depth of the God in which we're talking about. And I also want you to understand this. You can't get to heaven on your own as much as we'd like to believe we can. You cannot do it. The Bible tells us no one, not one, comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ said that. You can't get to the Father unless you accept the Son. I want you to understand that when you accept the Son, whenever Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you, he's talking about you. Why would you decline a relationship with a God like this? Sure, we come up with all kinds of reasons. We get scared sometimes and we don't understand how big this God is and we start worrying about, I'm not going to be able to really comprehend all this, and that's fine. I love thinking that if I understood everything about God, the fact of the matter is, if I knew everything about God, I wouldn't need Him, right? You wouldn't need God if you knew everything about Him. You're never going to know everything about Him. That's the greatest part of this relationship. It's like a relationship with your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend. You just started dating and you start learning all these things and then one day you get married and you're like, I never knew that. <laughs> you mean you brush your teeth in a shower? Weirdo? I don't do that. Um, depends on time. All right, but 
you get to just continuously be building this relationship with a God that loves you and he knows everything about you, but you don't know everything about him, but he wants you to know as much as you can and he wants you to have this relationship. So church, what are we going to do? First day, day one of this year, day one. We started in verse one, day one. What are we going to do? challenge you church I'm telling you you want big things believe in a big God you want to see God do big things believe it because he can with or without your belief he can do it and he will but it's so much better if you do I want to give you a couple takeaways and then we'll be out of here number one you are created in the image of God Genesis 126 tells us that it doesn't matter your flaws. It doesn't matter what you see when you look in the mirror. You are created in the image of the Almighty God. Number two, God's design is perfect. He is the only one who can form things and make things like light receptors in our eyes. He's the only one. Number three, you were created to bring him glory. Imagine the impact that you would have if starting tomorrow or Tuesday or whenever you go back to work, you walked into your office or your school or whatever it is you do, and you say, guess what? I might not be able to say it up front because of the rules and that. By gosh, they're going to see something different because I'm going to start living for my Jesus. I'm going to start living intentionally for my God. And lastly, number four, this all-knowing, star-creating, light-speaking God wants a relationship with you. Why wait? We come up with excuses, right? Why? Maybe this morning you're already saved and, and you've claimed Jesus as your Savior and you've accepted Him as your Savior, but maybe you just got to start over. Maybe you want to just ask God for another chance. He'll, he'll do it. But you got to ask him. Maybe you don't know him. Maybe you thought you did, but you don't. Maybe you want to do that today. Maybe you're hurting or you're broken and you just need prayer. Listen, you guys know me, that when I'm up here singing these songs, I tell you from the start, this altar is open the entire time. The altar is open right now. I'm going to go ahead and invite Dan and Don and whoever else, the other D's that we got on staff. You guys come on up because, listen, I'm going to tell you. Right now, in this very moment, this can be a, the most life-changing thing that's ever happened to you. Bigger than kids, bigger than wedding, bigger than anything else. This can be the moment right now. I'm a firm believer in these moments. So what's it going to be? Are we going to walk out of here unchanged and go through 02 January 2023 just like it was 02 January 2022? Or are we going to live like it's no, this is what God created me for and I'm going to do it? I encourage you folks, come. We'll sit here as long as we need to. Let's pray. Let's move forward with what God's got going on. We worship a creating God who loves you. Let me pray. God, thank you for just <laughs> who you are and, and who we are not. But God, I thank you for the fact that above all these things that we've, we've seen in creation and, and understanding just who you are and your character, God, I thank you that regardless God, should we seek you, we will find you. God, my prayer this morning is that we as a church as a whole will seek you. God, and our intention is to find you as many times and as many ways as we possibly can. God, allow us just to look and to yearn. God, my prayer this morning also, God, is for the broken and the heartbroken and the, and the people that are struggling and the people that... Uh, 
they, they feel this pull on them, but they don't know what to do about it. God, my prayer is that you give them courage. But God, I, I lift up the leadership of this church. God, allow us to be able to seek you in such a way that it's so contagious that our congregation family, God, that we can just pour out into them love and, and understanding and knowledge with, uh, of you, but God, let us seek you. God, we just, we love you. In your name we pray, amen. Would you stand, please?
heart change, folks. Please. Let me pray for us and be dismissed. God, thank you. the fact that there was nothingness and you created something. Thank you for the fact that you created and you spoke and you gave and you grew and then you breathed life. And thank you for the fact that even though you're such a huge God, you've called us into your own. Be with us as we go. Before we go, we got to say one more thing. In your name we pray. Amen. Sorry, I forgot. Let me get her up here where she at. Come on up, girl. No, you thought she was getting off easy. I about let you out, too. Go ahead and be seated. This is Miriam Pauper. I always say Miriam. Miriam Falpert. So her and her sister, her sister's up there, everybody wave at Sarah. She's doing our slides for us today. And, and her family, um, mom's here. Hi, mom. So Miriam's felt led to come and be a member of the church. She, you've been, hang on. You hold that. Um, Miriam's been helping us with our worship team for five, six months, probably seven months. And she's been helping us upstairs and, and doing stuff like that. So she's decided she wants to come and be a member, and we'd love to have you. We're, we're excited for you to be here. And thank you um, on behalf of the church. Welcome, right? Um, so usually what we do is we read something out and you repeat it. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is this. My prayer is, because I know Miriam, I know she's a believer, I know I know that, but, but what, I, what I encourage you to do is just to help tell the church what you believe. But I want you to do that face to face. Okay? We can sit here and quote it all day long, but I want you to say it to their face when you meet them. I want you to tell them what you believe and why you believe it. Okay? Church, we got to be living and active. This is what it is. This is not just a, a member of, a, 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 she didn't just like buy a seat. <laughs> she decided she wants to be a part of a breathing, living body. And that's, that's you. And that's me. So welcome, Miriam Valpert. I keep saying, I feel like I'm saying that one. Yeah. All right. Be sure to, uh, you didn't need this, did you? Um, <laughs> yeah. See, we're weird and awkward up here. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, be careful on your way home. Luckily, you guys don't have any fog to deal with on your way out. So be careful. We will see you on Wednesday night. Please come on Wednesday night for prayer night. We'll see you guys later. Be blessed. In hell.